Hi, everyone. Good evening. I'm Mayor Manny Figueroa, and welcome to this special Township of Union and PAL program for families with special needs children. I'm happy that you are able to join us here at Town Hall here in person, for those of you that are here, and virtually those out there in social media land on Facebook Live. This program is being recorded and will replay on Union TV and our social media sites. We do this so you don't have to worry about missing anything during the program, and so you can help us share this valuable information with, with others. So as parents and guardians of special needs children, the question of caring for your children when you're gone is always a major concern. It's a tough subject that no one wants to think about, but in reality, not planning for the future can be detrimental to your child. What are the best options, not only for your child, but for you and for your family? What options are even available to you, especially as your child reaches adult age? Tonight, we will discuss guardianship and trusts. And to do that, we have with us James Garland here and Sandy Lascari, who will offer their expertise and answer questions from our audience and from Facebook Live. James Garland is a partner at Coughlin, Middleage, and Garland in Morristown, New Jersey. He has devoted his practice to estate and trust planning, estate and trust litigation, elder law, and guardianships. James frequently lectures in front of community groups such as these to ensure that families know their options before getting started. James, thank you for being with us here this evening. Thank you. Sandy Lascari is an attorney of the law offices of Sandra L. Lascari, LLC. Her practice represents parents of children with disabilities, guardianships, and related matters. She is also an adjunct professor down the road right here at Kane University. Sandy, thank you so much for being here with us this evening. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you both for joining us, and I look forward to a wonderful conversation. We're going to begin with some <coughs> questions that we've pre-programmed, and then we will open it up to the audience for any questions that you might have. Uh, and I'll open this up to either of you and either of one of you just come in. What programs do you recommend that parents and guardians take advantage of? What are the costs involved, if any, in these programs? You know, uh, since we're on social media, it's so important for families to recognize that there are many groups on social media that can offer parents with special needs some advice. And we usually find that there are parent groups that are out there on Facebook, uh, on Instagram, talking about special needs. And when I uh, meet with parents, one of the things that we always find is that they have either found us via social media, they've spoken to other parents that they have networked with, and they've belonged to various organizations. So one, for example, um, you could go to SPAN, which is a group that offers information about uh, education law. Uh, there's also the Education Law Center, which is a public entity that offers advice to parents in regard to special needs. Uh, there's also Autism Speaks, which is a wonderful group that has many different facets that is, you know, offering information. So I say reach out to that social media and find out other parents. Also, any organization that if your child has a specific issue, uh, like autism or um, dyslexia, there's always a group that's out there that can assist you and offer some information. So Google away. <laughs> Very important. That first acronym you mentioned, was it SPAN? SPAN, yeah. Uh, S-P-A-N. That is a special needs parent association network. And uh, you'll often see them mentioned in offering advice free of charge to parents in that regard. And usually in any kind of document in IEP, they'll send you to the SPAN network. Okay. And that brings me to another part of that question, Jim. I don't know if you can answer. Are there costs involved in some of these, uh, uh, these sites, these web pages? Well, you probably know that better than I do. I'm okay. not aware of anything. Most of, I'm not aware of anything that really okay. costs anything. I know that sometimes there's a lecture or there's something that's sponsored that would ask for a donation, but most of the information is free and certainly, you yeah, know, available to the public. They're trying to help people out that have children with special needs, mm -hmm. turn, which is nice, but I don't know of any that charges a fee of any kind. No, I'm not aware no. of anything like that. 
All right, for some of them that are watching, how does guardianship specifically work in New Jersey? So what is the process for someone naming a guardian for a special needs child, Jim? Well, just one aspect before we sure. get to that. So if the child's underage, then you can name your guardian in your will. The problem is, is that when the child emancipates at age 18, now they're, they're, you need a guardian because the parents have no control or say over their needs. Though so most hospitals, if the child's in a hospital, will go according to what the parents want. But that doesn't necessarily mean that's going to happen. There are issues that I've had clients, you've had clients, where the hospital will not release information about the child. So recognize that when a child turns 18, that's the turning point and they are considered emancipated and an adult. And even if they can't make great decisions in regard to education, legal matters, medical matters, it, one of the reasons why we encourage the guardianship is because that permits the parent to continue in that fashion. I often know that I, I do special education and so we're dealing with IEPs. Oftentimes, right in the IEP, it will say, you know, when a child turns 18, you don't have the authority, the child has to participate. A simple way to handle that is making sure that your child has released information or allows you to participate in the IEP meeting. But the guardianship and having guardianship protects you legally in all those aspects. Yeah, and, and just to add, so, so recently we had a case where the young daughter ended up being hospitalized in a psychiatric hospital. And the hospital wouldn't give any information to the parents at all which became a problem because they sent her all the way down to Trenton when she lives up here in Somerset County. So it took a long time to get her released and sent up to, up here to Morristown Hospital to their psychiatric ward. So it's important, the guardianship aspect of it is extremely important because you don't want to lose control of a child who has issues because they can't speak many times for themselves. They're not recognized to have an authority to give any information to anybody, so it becomes a significant issue where the guardianship is extremely important because they couldn't be placed in a, in a place where they should not be. And the parents should not be in a position where they lose any kind of say or control over their child. That scenario is just horrible that you've just described. I, ca I can't imagine being a parent and being told that I have no say <coughs> over my child or cannot be informed of that child's status. Therefore, when should a parent begin this guardianship process? They should not wait till a month before that child well, turns 18. Well, actually, Mayor, uh, for the guardianship process, and when you apply formally for the court, you have to wait. They, they, the court won't allow you to make that application until a month before, before. turning wow. the age of 18. Okay. But as Jim indicated, uh, doing careful estate planning, you can also designate a person. And that doesn't even mean for a child that's necessary a special needs child that's for any child under the age of 18 you need to be thinking if something happens to me who's going to take care of my children yeah no add to that you can prepare your paperwork before that month of filings and that's what you try to do you really start months a few months before you get all the paperwork done so when you're ready to file you can file because you really don't want to have a gap in time right. because right. if you think about it if it happened during COVID, you could be waiting months mm -hmm. before you have a hearing, if at all. And one of the key elements to that preparation is that you will need two doctor's <coughs> documentations <coughs> indicating the diagnosis of the child. And sometimes if you're waiting for that appointment, you might have to wait a month or two months to get that appointment. And the court requires that the medical document that you present that gives the diagnosis of your child, which is mandated by the statute, has to be current within 30 days of the application. So you need to make sure that you are timing it just correctly, and that's why that preparation is helpful. Yeah. Most times when we do it, we prepare all the verified complaint, all the pleadings be filed, but, and then we get, once we have that done, we then get the doctors to evaluate them because you have that 30-day window. If you miss it by a day, the court can turn around and say, you gotta do the whole process well, again. Well. And then, you know, it costs a lot for doctors. The doctors usually want their money up front. They usually, in my experience is they want 750 up front each. Uh, it can be a little higher. So, and then what happens is when you file your action, and you do a lot more of these than I do, 
But Let's just talk about some of the documents that you need. Certainly, you can go to New Jersey Courts online, and they will have a packet of documents. But it's often helpful for people. Is that better? It's often helpful for people uh, to have a, an attorney in place that helps them through the process. But that's not saying that you can't go through the process. And the court is very welcoming to that situation. And they understand it's difficult to be a parent with special needs. And sometimes it's costly. So what's going to happen is you're going to make that initial application. And like Jim says, there's quite a few documents that you have to file. You have to have a case information statement. You have to have the verified complaint which means that you have to indicate the procedures that what you're saying in the documentation and what you're presenting to the court is a truthful statement. You need those two doctor's statements that we talked about. But there's also a certification that indicates how much money the person may have or how much is in their possession. So you have to indicate if they have less than $5,000 or not on a certification. Certain counties, and what Jim and I find is it depends on the county, but they're trying to make it more universal. There are situations in which you might need to be fingerprinted. <coughs> or that, and certainly what the court is going to do is the court is going to, on the first round of the guardianship, after you have submitted all of the documentation that you need to submit, they're going to sign an order and they're going to really appoint another attorney or a attorney to review the documentation and come and speak to you and your child. And that person has been appointed by the court to represent the person who is going to be looking for the guardianship or actually is going to need a guardian. So when I am hired, I'm usually hired by the parents, and I represent the parent. And then there's another attorney that is also appointed by the court that represents the child in question. And so that order is an order to show cause. It's part of your application, which means everything's on an expedited basis. And presumably, when you file your order to show cause, you're supposed to have a hearing within about 30 days. But that never happens. Because as Sandra says, the court appoints an attorney to represent the alleged incapacitated or disabled person. That person always asks for an, for an extension of time because they just get the paperwork and they need time which to do their evaluation. So they will talk to the person they've been appointed. They're the, call, the guardian ad litem for that individual, essentially. They will also talk to all the family members and anybody else they think is appropriate in determining that the person that's, being a that's asking to be appointed as the guardian is the appropriate person for that particular child to be the guardian. So essentially, that person, though it represents the alleged incapacitated person, they're also representing the court because they're making a recommendation to the court. And that person doesn't need to come through the attorney who brought the action for permission to go talk to anybody. They can do that on their own. Usually. They'll call and say, look, I want to talk to so-and-so just to let you know, and that's perfectly fine. Sometimes they'll ask if you want to be there. We usually say no, because let them do what they're going to do, because we're not going to change anything. We really can't interfere. Um, but it does, so that, judge, that attorney, when he does his valuation, will render his report to the court, and he'll send it to everybody else, and then there'll be hearing after that date. Now, the disabled child or the alleged incapacity person has the right to come to that hearing. Often they do not. The judge will then, agree if everything goes fine, will then talk to the, the person who's asking to be appointed as the guardian and ask them some questions to make sure they understand what they're doing and go over some of the rules of what has to be done. They'll get appointed and then you will go to the surrogate's office with the order to say, and you've been appointed, and you go through the process of the surrogate's office where you get your letters of guardianship. And no, uh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. That's, that's a very important <coughs> aspect. When you make this application, you're making the application in your county where you reside to the surrogate's office. That is usually a place where they're probating wills, but it is also the office where you file your application for guardianship. Now, as part of the whole process, as part of the paperwork you have to submit, you have to submit an affidavit or certification or in the pleadings as to what the incapacitated person's assets are. And usually it's nothing. Um, as a child, there's usually nothing. Maybe it's SSI and that's it. Now, the, when you make your application, usually you ask that the guardian serve without bond. 
uh, because there is no assets. And usually the courts will say, that's fine, you can serve without bond. Um, but as part of the process, once you're appointed as a guardian, you have filing requirements every year. You have to file an accounting with the surrogate as to what you've done with your assets. You also have to provide a certification as to kind of what you've done in taking care of that individual, meaning you made sure they got clothes, you took them here, you took them there, you're helping them get, go to school. So you have to give a report of what you're doing as to their welfare at the same time. Um, uh, do you have anything else to add on that? That's, that's required on an <coughs> annual basis. And the court will expect you to, you know, to, to receive documentation in that regard. Um, but also, uh, you'll also have to take into consideration that situation where, let's say a child has been a victim of a medical malpractice situation. So there's the guardianship of the person and there's the guardianship of the estate. And this doesn't mean that the, the child is not viable or living. This means that the child has certain amount of assets. Right. And we need to disclose that to the court. And what the court is concerned with is if a child has been a beneficiary of that kind of situation in a medical malpractice case, let's say. The real concern is how is the money being used? And what is the money being used for? So the court is going to spend a little time looking at that. And that is why they're asking about the assets and that piece of certification. Many students obviously don't have any assets. But in those u unique situations, the court's going to want a disclosure about that. Now, when you apply for guardianship, the, the, the trend these days or what the court's preference is, is to do it more as a limited guardianship as to a full guardianship. A full guardianship means they strip you, the child, of all their rights. They can't vote. They don't have any say as to any kind of assets. They have no say as to basically anything. But a limited says, well, I'm going to appoint somebody, and they may say, you still have certain rights. You can vote. You can socialize who you want to socialize with. You can have an account where you can, you can manage that with small account. So they, they tr the idea is to not to strip people of all their dignity and take all those rights away, is to let them have some rights as an, as an individual and just take certain things away from where they cannot manage the large, a large amount of assets. And it may be also making medical decisions for them, the withholding, withdrawing the life support, or any other medical decisions. That is what the goal is the statutes these days. It's not like it once was years ago. They just stripped everybody of their rights. And that's an important, that's an important thing to recognize. And the court bends over backwards, in the, and as will the court-appointed attorney, to determine what kind of rights should the individual have or not have. And that's important. So, so for example, <coughs> Many parents know that children who have special needs are often afraid of vaccinations. And in order for them to go to school, oftentimes they are required to have certain vaccinations. And I had a case in which the child had turned 18 and there was no way that they were going to want a vaccination voluntarily. So by the parent having that guardianship opportunity, they could make that decision to say, OK, I know you're afraid of this situation, but we're going to have to do this. And so it gives you that extra ability. But it's also a responsibility, because we want to be very respectful of our special needs students and our special needs children and make sure that they're saying or giving an opinion to situations. But there are some situations that the parent has to make the decision in or else they can't get the next step done. So uh, that is why the guardianship is important because it's, it gives you the authority to say to the medical person, no, this child's gonna need this vaccination. Now one last thing I'll mention on this is um, <clears throat> some clients come <laughs> and, and they have a child or essentially a daughter that's got special needs, and they're concerned about the daughter getting pregnant. And the question that comes up is they want to see if they could have the child have a hysterectomy. Now, you have to understand that the child has constitutional rights to procreate. So you can't just go to court and say, I want to have a, have a hysterectomy. It is a Supreme Court decision in New Jersey that lays out all the factors, and you have to pass all those factors, essentially and um, they are tough factors to pass. So it's not an easy thing to say, I want the child to be, have a hysterectomy. That's going to be difficult to obtain. 
in some of my documents, it's that question that you said about voting. But I also sometimes include if the parent wants to make sure that the parent or the child can, can get married. Yes. And that's also a factor. <clears throat> Yes, and sometimes you, you, they'll do that, but you sometimes put in the order that if they're going to get married, they have to have a prenup agreement. Not because they necessarily have assets, but because of assets they may inherit down the line and what the trust may be or set up at that point in time. So you just have to remember that even though the child has special needs, they're, they're still a human being and they still have constitutional rights and they have to be treated like anyone else with those constitutional rights. They should not be stripped cavalierly of all those rights. So when you fashion the judgment, the final judgment, it's really to be what's in the best interest of the child now and in the future. And that's important to recognize. You could always go down the line if you wanted to, this, if things got really turned, the child deteriorated significantly, line, you could always go down the line and come back to modify the guardianship. But the goal is limited, limited guardianship. A lot of information, wow. It, it is more <coughs> complex and, and we don't think about these things, but it's a very complex issue, and especially that last point. They are human beings, they do have rights, so um, it, it, is, it is great that we have this information being shared. Uh, are there alternatives to guardianship? Jim, this one. Yes, so not every child that's disabled needs to have a guardianship. It depends upon their level of competency. You could have people who are autistic but are on the, you know, they're on the lower end of the scale. Um, they, are, they can sign, if they're competent, they can sign a power of attorney, a living will, and a medical power in naming their parents as their agents. As long as the doctor feels they're competent enough to understand what they're signing. So it doesn't always have to be, let's do a guardianship. It depends upon the child and where, what, what degree of level of competency they are at. Just because someone, for example, is bipolar doesn't mean they can't sign a power of attorney. It's, as you're getting the meds taken care of and, and, and straightened out, they can ultimately sign a power of attorney. You could have someone with As Asperger's, they can sign a power of attorney. It just depends. Autistic children, maybe they don't, they're not badly autistic, but they can sign those documents. The downside of those, by the way, is they could always revoke them at any time, so don't, don't piss them off. <laughs> well, you also have to take into consideration that um, just because your child has an individualized education plan doesn't necessarily mean that your child is required to have a guardianship. So many students need special services but are very capable of making decisions, going on to college, doing all of the things that we want in a productive life. So those students Although there is a question in the guardianship application that you can use the IEP as one of the documents of proof of disability, take that into consideration as well when you're thinking about the planning. If you have an IEP, it doesn't necessarily mean that your child needs a guardian. And who will make that decision? I think that's a parent decision, and you know how high-functioning your child is or is not. And you know the kinds of decisions that like I gave the example. Uh, is it going to be that this child is going to need to do X, Y, and Z to get on an airplane so we can go and have a vacation? So how am I going to be able to facilitate that? Or is it a situation where my child's applying to colleges and might need some kind of modification? That's not a situation where we're looking at guardianship necessarily. And also one of the questions in the application is going to be, has this person the individual that you're looking to formulate guardianship for executed a will, executed a power of attorney, or have taken on any of those documentations. Court wants to know that because obviously, as Jim has said, you can't have the guardianship and all of those documents in place as well because they're going to conflict with one another. Oh, I'm so sorry. I apologize. Did you want me to repeat something else? How can, how can I help? <coughs> okay. I'm, I'm sorry. Okay, anything to add to that, Joe? We're in Union We're County. County.
you know, that is the greatest area of challenge for me in my practice, is that we know that we're educating children between the ages of 3 and 21. And most children have an opportunity to participate in social activities. When they turn 21, you can make an application to the Division of Developmental Disabilities. And doing that, by that situation, what ends up happening is that you might be able to find more organizations or entities for your student to have what is necessary in that regard. Um, you have to go out there and find organizations and different Sometimes you'll find them through religious organizations. I know the JCC offers great, you know, offers uh, of for children with special needs. I know that various Catholic organizations offer programs for children with special needs. I know that you can also contact the Department of Education in the state of New Jersey and see if there are any events or organizations. And that's what's great with the mayor's offering, is that there, if we need programs, then we need to investigate and, and, and sort of fund those programs as well. I know your frustration. I know. Because there's not a lot of places for the kids to go. Thank you, Sandra. We're going we're gonna to continue with the questions we have here, and then we will open it up to the audience questions at the end. So. Please hold your questions. Uh, let's get into special needs trust. Uh, what are the benefits of it, and what is the process for uh, setting up a special needs trust? So we're talking about the under 18 child as right. we're moving towards that age. It actually it turns out even once they become age 18, it, it becomes an issue. So there really are two types of trusts. Um, the typical special needs trust is, would be more considered what they call a first party trust, a trust that using the, the child's money and putting into a trust for their benefit. And then there's the third party trust, which is a trust for the benefit of the, the child, which is using the parent's money or somebody else's money. Third party trusts are sometimes called supplemental needs trusts, whereas first party trusts are somewhat called special needs trusts. But everybody calls it special needs trust mm -hmm. at this point. Now, there are distinct differences between these two. And, uh, First party trust, we'll call it the first party trust that's using the child's money, that's a trust that, that has to comply with various state statutes. And in that, one of the statute, one of the provisions is that when the child dies, the money that's remaining in the trust must go to the state of New Jersey to reimburse the state for any funds they paid on that child's behalf. You also have to provide an accounting everywhere to, to Trenton regarding what you've done with the assets of the trust, and if you want to make disbursements to the trust, once they start to exceed $5,000, you have to get permission from the state as to make the distribution. And, and to give you an example of how bad it can be is, if you wanted to buy a, a, a car for the child and it was gonna cost $23,000, they could turn around and tell you, we think you should buy this $12,000 car instead. They have that much control over the distribution or, of disbursements from the funds. Or as you were telling me earlier, they, they made the people sit in a different plane seat, which was much cheaper. So, so you use those first party trusts when you have no choice because the child has gotten some money. Either someone bequested the money under will directly to them or gifted money to them and it would and by getting that money, you could jeopardize or compromise any governmental assistance they're receiving. So you need to put it in that trust so you can preserve their assistance. Third party trusts are much different. Those are created typically under a will or as a separate trust, standby trust or a living trust that you set up for the benefit of, of the child. Now, when you, these trusts that are set up, you're going to need an attorney to do those trusts because especially the trusts that, that the first party trusts are very complicated. There's citations to lots of code sections, you know, federal sections. It, it, no individual can do that on their own. I can tell you that right now. Um, for a trust in the will, you need to have an attorney do that because the language of the trust has to be such that you're not jeopardizing and compromising their assistance. The sole purpose not the sole purpose. One of the purposes of the trust is to make sure that either trust, that you, not, that you do not jeopardize or compromise any governmental assistance they're receiving or any other benefits they're receiving from a private agency or some charitable organization. So, for example, a lot of children are end up in group homes and the state is paying for that. But if they have 
too much money or the trust is designed where they have access to it for, say, their health or maintenance and support, those assets in the trust will be deemed available for the child's care, which will then put them over the eligibility thresholds and they'll lose the benefit and now the trust is paying for that money. The other benefit for the trust is that Medicaid, most people end up with Medicaid paying for everything. Medicaid doesn't pay for everything. So you need some funds to pay for the child, such as clothes. There's also, you may want to use the money because the child may be in a place that at some point down the line the trustee decides, I don't think this is the appropriate place for this child anymore. I want to move the child somewhere else. And you may need money in which to do that because you may decide, I'm not going to go with Medicaid anymore. I want to go to a private place because I have enough money to do that and I don't think it's appropriate where they're at. They're not being taken care of. So the, the, the trusts are really designed to preserve and protect those assets for the benefit of the child because you have no idea what the child's needs are going to be down the line. And, and I'm skipping ahead. But right. That's fine. But one of the things is when people come in and we talk about these special needs trusts, one of the first things that you have, we discuss with them, and, and all attorneys do this, is how much it's going to cost to maintain that child should something happen to both parents. And you look at it as if you're dying in the next three to five years. Most parents don't realize how much it costs to raise a child that has needs. It's because they're living in the house with the parents. That's already being taken care of parents. The food's being taken care of for the parents. Clothes are being taken care of for the parents. Everything's being taken care of by the parents of the child. But think of it from this standpoint, if you're not alive, if both parents die, what happens to the child then? Who pays for that? How much money is that going to cost? And depending on the age of the child, you know, the child can live a long period of time and that can cause, cause a significant amount of money that you need down the line to take care of that child. So part of the issue is when you look at these special needs trusts, you have to start looking financially, how much is it going to cost if we die tomorrow to raise our child and take good care of a child? And then the next question is, do I have enough money to do that? And if I don't have enough money to do it, how do I get that money? And that, I'm skipping way ahead, I'm sorry. No, and, and I think, <coughs> if I may just interject real quick, I think that brings a point, should family uh, have outside people involved in that trust, just for that fact that you've just stated. Outside meaning trustees? Outside could be outside of the family that has set up this trust. Yeah, should you, they include others? In that? Yeah, the answer is, you have. yes, that's a great point. Um, Special needs planning isn't just planning of the mom and dad, it's the entire family, it's grandparents, it's aunts and uncles, because you want to make sure everybody's on the same page. You don't want to have a grandparent saying, I love my child, I'm going to send them $100,000 and gives it to them outright, and you've designed everything to protect those programs, and now the child got $100,000, and now they're losing all the programs because they don't meet the eligibility requirements anymore. So you want everybody on the same page as to what you're doing, and planning for the child down the line. That's extremely important because yes. it happens too often that, that they don't talk to the rest of the family members and the next thing you know, I have a problem in my hands because somebody said the child just got a, a significant amount of money and, and now all hell is breaking loose because they're losing all their benefits. But, but take it a step back for a second and can, I want to make sure you can hear me. When we're talking about children becoming 18 and becoming an adult, at that point in time, Social Security, SSI, and when Jim is referring to those governmental benefits, we're specifically talking about SSI benefits, and meaning that your child is entitled, if they are permanently disabled, to Social Security benefits. And when they turn 18, you can make that application. And when you make that application, you go to your local Social Security office in the county or in the town that you are located and make that application. When you make that application for government benefits, it's going to provide two things. It's going to provide a certain stipend for the child, but it's also going to provide that Medicaid, which is that precious health insurance that they desperately need. 
Now, many of you may already have a situation where you've made an application and they're receiving Social Security benefits because you're disabled or because your income level is such that the Social Security benefits are already being provided to your child. But in some circumstances, your income and your status no longer affects the child. So that turning of 18, even if you're applying for guardianship and you're making that application so that you're making decisions for the child, you're also filing that application form for Social Security. So why do we need the Special Needs Trust? Jim's talking to you about various aspects of the trust, but why do you need the trust? You need the trust because, God forbid, something happens to you and you pass away. Your child normally in a normal circumstance is going to inherit, right? Most people come and if they're doing a basic estate plan, they're gonna say, if I pass away, I want my children, no matter how many children I have, to equally benefit from whatever I have, hmm. right? Isn't that typically what parents do? So if you leave, let's say you have three children and one of your children is a, or child is a special needs child. If you give them more than $2,000 per month at any given time, they will lose the Social Security benefits that they have, and they will decrease those Social Security benefits. So we have situations where we want special needs children to work. They take into account the income that the special needs child is making. And if you're given a specific stipend and that amount of money, they're going to decrease that amount of money because they're going to take into the consideration the income. And the amount they're using is that $2,000 amount. So what Jim has also talked about is the fact that my grandfather wants to leave my special needs child some money in their will. Well, let's say he just leaves her $5,000. That $5,000, given that way, well, is certainly more than two, right? If we do basic math, that's going to throw them right off Social Security and right off SSI because they've inherited an amount that's in excess. So by creating the trust, all of those funds that you would have given to your child are placed in that trust so that whoever is going to be the trustee has some funding so that they can provide other services and other assets to them. So when we, we talk about thinking about the trust and why we need the trust, you have to go back to what's the basic estate plan and thinking, okay, I want my child to have Social Security benefits. I want to make sure I have Medicaid. It doesn't mean that if your child, let's say, is under the age of 26, you should check with your, your corporation or your company that you work for if they're going to keep your child on uh, benefits, right? And with a disabled child, sometimes that will entitle them to continue on those medical benefits for the rest of their life. But it doesn't hurt to have the additional benefit of Medicaid and, 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 and know the difference. Medicare, C-A-R-E, is what we provide to people who are over the age of 65. Medicaid, C-A-I-D, is what we're providing for special needs children and goes with the SSI. So I, I just wanted to make that no, point, and, and I think... No, I, I just want to go back, though, because you mentioned some interest in the other children. Part of the process when you, when we design the wills for people that have more than one child, you have to make the dis dis decision, as, as Sandra alluded to, do you give everything equally to each child? And the answer is most cl clients will decide not to do that because they figure the child who doesn't have a disability can, can get a job down the line and they'll be fine, but the child who does, who has a disability, is probably not going to generate a lot of money in their life. And whatever they inherit, that's it. So there usually is a disproportionate distribution upon death. Now, sometimes the, child, the older children say, don't give me any money. I want to make sure my brother or sister are taken care of. Now, sometimes the things that come up, you know, let's talk about this, the trust itself, the things you want to have in there. Then in the trust itself, you don't want, you want to specifically say the trustee has the sole, absolute, and uncontrolled uh, discretion to make distributions on behalf of the child. You don't give a standard because the Medicaid and SSI seize on that and they say all well, the assets are available now we have a problem. The other thing you also want to put in there is something where the trustee has the right to hire a care manager. 
So if something happens to you, the trustee can hire somebody who can be looking on your child and be an advocate, an additional advocate for your child. So if your child is at a group home, the manager will go to that group home periodically to check on the child to make sure they're being taken care of appropriately. And if not, they'll report back to the trustee and the guardians that we have a problem here we need to address. And, and most of the care managers are very good. They will go directly right to the person, admissions or administrator of the place and said, we have a problem, you need to take care of this. Now the interesting thing is sometimes people overlook is you get the child on Medicaid and they figure Medicaid will pay for all my child's medical expenses and yes and no. The problem is that not all doctors take Medicaid. So sometimes it's beneficial for the child to get their own separate medical through the Affordable Care Act so they can get access to additional doctors that might be out there that normally Medicaid will not pay, for, that the doctor won't take Medicaid for. And that's something that you have to give some thought to. Um, and in those third party trusts, the state of New Jersey does not have to be a beneficiary of the estate when, he die, when the child dies, the money you would determine where it goes. This goes to the other children. If your disabled child has children, does it go to those children? Where does the money go? That's just part of the process of designing where the assets go when something happens to that child. And most of those trusts are designed that if Medicaid or some government agency would determine the assets in the trust are available, the trustee has the right to essentially terminate the trust and send the money elsewhere. So it has kind of a chilling effect of Medicaid trying to challenge the trust. So, and you know, one aspect of these trusts is, is it's not just, and you've alluded to it, it's just not just preserving the government assistance programs, it's also protecting the child from themselves and from everybody else out there. A lot of children who have disabled are very vulnerable to a lot of people out there, and this is to protect them from those people. Now, there's nothing that says a disabled child can't get married, but at least if the assets are in the trust, they're protected in case they were to get divorced. So there are other aspects to it. It's also protected in the event that the child, for example, can drive a car, gets in an accident, and gets sued for millions of dollars, the assets in the trust are protected from creditors. So there are other aspects of this trust that are important to recognize. So, I'm now, I want to go ahead, I wanna think. Go so the, the big key, and, and Sandra and I were talking about this earlier on the way down here, is that we can draft a great document, but it's worthless if my trustees are bad. It's all about the trustees, and you have to pick good trustees. Now, and the trustee, like, just to find that, Jim, it's a person who's going to be managing the assets in the fund. They manage them for the benefit of the beneficiary, and I usually prefer to have two trustees for the simple reason I have a check and balance, because there could be a lot of money there and there's too much temptation. But the more important thing is, if I only have one trustee, and that trustee's on vacation somewhere, and I need access to the funds, I can't get a hold of that trustee, that's a problem. So I need to have at least two trustees. And you would also need to name successors or substitutes because there's a possibility a trustee may at some point say, I don't want to do this anymore. Because the trustee's function in these instances is to collaborate with the guardian. It isn't just to manage the assets. They have to get to know the child and know what's going on in the child's life so they can make effective and informed decisions as what they should or should not do with the funds. So it is a collaborative effort. Most people pick other family members. You can pick a corporate trustee. The problem is most banks and corporate trustees will not serve as a trustee of a special needs trust because of liability and because of the, requ the requirement, the requirement, because of the work that's required in taking care of and managing the needs of that particular child. There are some corporations that will serve as trustees of special needs trust, but most of them will not these days. One other aspect is some people are wonderful with your children and you know that they will take care of your child and be a wonderful person in the event that something happens for, to you. But the other aspect is that person who's the wonderful caregiver may not be the best person with money. 
right? And so by having two people or having a third party that's part of that, maybe you're saying, I want my uh, sister Kathy to take care of my son, but I think George is much better at organizing and making sure that everything is, is set as far as how those assets are going to be invested. And maybe we need to use a third party investor to take those assets that's in the trust and, and make them as most lucrative as possible. One of the things that we talked about prior, and I think we have to mention it, Mayor, is an insurance policy. Right. Uh, I meant to mention it before. I'm going to go back to one thing you said about the third. You can structure a trust document that says that you name a corporate institution that just manages the assets only and has no other responsibilities with, um, with respect to trusts. Now, a lot of corporates will do that because you remove them the liability of having to take care of the child. All they're doing is just managing the assets. And some clients feel more comfortable with a corporate institution manage it as opposed to a family member managing those assets. So you can bifurcate the, the, the roles of the trustees. And by the way, a guardian can be a trustee. That's not an issue. You know, it's really up to what you, who you feel comfortable and with. And that aspect of the care manager is important too. Because oftentimes when people come uh, to my office, and I know to Jim's office, they're saying, okay, I have three children. I have one child that is a special needs child. And I'm going to put my other child in the event that something happens to me. I'm going to make my other child either the guardian or co-guardian with me. Or also, I'm going to use that other child or work with that other child to become eventually the trustee in regard to the estate if something happens to me. Sometimes the child wants to move away or go to a different state or has a job opportunity. And you don't want to limit your other child from having the kind of life that they want to have. So a care manager is a great person or at least to provide in the trust so you can say, okay, in the event that this doesn't work out, we're going to put a care manager or you have the option to hire a care manager. So let's say your child is in a fabulous group home in the state of New Jersey, but your other child needs to go take a job in California. Who's going to be watching that child or at least visiting that child in that group home? So by having that care manager in place, at least somebody is going to the group home or going to wherever that child is located and making sure their living conditions are appropriate. They're, they're getting the appropriate food and, and whatever care that they need. And at least that person can go back to your child who's in California and say, I went there two days ago and everything's fine. So that's an important... Yeah, I may piggyback a little bit on that. So it is common that clients come in, they want to name their 18-year-old or 19-year-old child as the guardian for or trustee for their, other, their sister or brother who's disabled. And, and you have to give some serious thought to that. If that child's going to college, do you really want to burden that child with having to take care of their, their sibling? Because it's an enormous responsibility. So you have, a lot of people want, but when I mention that people, they start thinking about that's not fair to the child. But the documents are designed where you can put in a document that one, trustees can name their successors. You can put in a document that when my other child reaches a certain age, they can come in as a co-trustee. Um, you can put provisions in when they're older and more mature and wiser that they can come in. Um, so there are ways to bring other kids in, and if you don't do anything, the other trustees can bring in that child in if they think it's appropriate at a certain period of time. But I, I think you need to give some serious thought as do I want to burden my other children when they're young and going to college to take care of their, their sibling, and that's probably not the right approach. There's a lot of stress and pressure for them. So. Great. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Sandra. I want to give some time for our audience both on Facebook and here in front of us to ask some questions. I'm going to start with a Facebook question that I received here from Elsie. I'm currently going through the guardianship process with someone who's 18 and on the severe end of the autism spectrum. As you know, the courts are backed up. How can I protect him until we get a court date? I'm afraid that we won't have any say should something happen to us. 
If you've already made the application for guardianship, you can bring those papers and say, we have filed a complaint. <coughs> if you've already made the application for guardianship and it's pending, you can go in and say, I have filed for guardianship. Here is my paperwork for the complaint, and we are waiting on guardianship. That gives you a certain amount of authority right there. Uh, what I often say to parents is it doesn't hurt for you to have a paragraph on a piece of paper, maybe notarized, that says my parent can take an interest in my education, can take an interest in my health care, just as some kind of statement um, that gives you that little interim piece. The, the other option is, remember, the court appoints a court-appointed attorney for the individual, and you can sometimes talk to the court-appointed the court-appointed attorney and ask them to get involved if something happens or if you need access for, for information. Um, there was a gentleman that had a hand up earlier back here. Sir, we're going to have a microphone brought back to you. Don't be shy. Oh, you don't need a mic. Go ahead. They need a, they, so the people online can hear your question because it might be something that they're concerned with. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> Verizon. I was wondering, like, who do I fight against this guardianship? Because I feel like, like I have a child who can't talk or walk. So why do I have to go through all this guardianship if I've been raising him all this time and I'm still is raising him? It's not fair that I take him to a doctor appointment. Oh, do you have guardianship? This is my child. This is my son. Un un I, <laughs> unfortunately, that's the law. And the law can be an ass, so. <laughs> <laughs> they need to change it. I mean, because yeah. he, it's, he, he can't answer nothing for itself. No, I, no. Unfortunately, the law says at age 18, they're em the child's emancipated. Um, and, and you've got the HIPAA regulations out there that creates more of a problem for the people. As I said earlier, the client whose child got sent to a psychiatric hospital and couldn't get any information at all, at all, wasn't even allowed to see the child. It became a big problem. Um, but that's the way the law works these days. So how much is your cost? for you to do this, because it seems like everywhere I go, it's like, oh, 3,000 here, 4,000 here. I'm, I'm kind of on the, unfortunately, I, I, like, I think I'm on the cheaper side, more, I'm on the more reasonable side. So I, look, I, when I usually do a special needs trust, we, we bill hourly, but we cap. We cap at two grand. So. I now, guardianships, however, applications are completely different. They are expensive, and, and now you are, well, I will lie to about that. I, I think that one of the alternatives is you know you need to do the guardianship. If you contact your surrogate's <coughs> office, they will help you go through the documents and prepare, or at least so that you can prepare them on your own. I know it's a very challenging thing. You may want to check in to legal services and see if legal services will offer you some assistance in at least filling out the documentation. It is on New Jersey courts online, and it's not impossible to do. Uh, well, it, the I got fee the paperwork. I got the paperwork. Okay, great. So yeah, you got the paperwork. My question was like, I had three other. I got two other kids. I have my son who is 17, and I was like, if something happened to me and my wife. Would he be able to, uh, can I put him on being a 17? You no? can't put a person who's under the age of 18 to be the guardian. Because next uh, year. But I'm next sorry. year he'll next will year be. he'll be 18. He'll be fine. And then he would have to go through all the fighting, and then he would have to wonder how, hey, Dad, i got to come up with 2000 No, no, no. Y'all have to no. pay for a lawyer again? There can is, I put him on now? You can put him on now. Oh, okay. And I would explain to the court, Look, I'm limited in funding, and I wouldn't hesitate to say that. And I've put my 17-year-old son here as a co-guardian, and I recognize that he's 17, but I don't expect that there's going to be a problem. Now, the court may not allow it, and the court may allow it, so you're going to have to just talk to the judge and see if you can make that allowance in that regard. And I'll also tell you this. You can wait till next year until your other son is 18 years of age and make the application. But you run the risk of not having any kind of protection during that period of time. So many times people come to us and they say, we don't even know that we needed to get a guardianship. And the child is 25, 30 years of yeah, age. I didn't know. I just right? Yeah, people I mean, didn't know. My son over 18. I just found right. Out. I'm so, I so. Exactly. So don't feel that you have to, if you haven't made the window at the age of 18, that you're not going to be able to make that application. Okay. Other questions? In the back, the lady in the back. Officer Campos, thank you. Thank you. 
Hi, good evening. Good evening. Um, my case is a little different. Um, I actually take care of my special needs brother. Our mom passed away suddenly last year. So he's come to live with my husband and I, and she had like nothing was in order. So like as of now, I'm trying to go, I am going through DDD um, to try to get some uh, assistance. He's 51, so he's older than me. But my question is like, do I follow the same steps as far as like setting up a trust for him? Because, you know, God forbid he passes, before I do, then I don't, I, like, that's my concern, like, making sure that he's taken care of if he were to go first, you know what I mean, so. Any, anybody can set up a, a special needs or supplemental trust for another individual. Um, so if you want to have in your wills or a separate, re, you know, irrevocable tr revocable trust, where you want to say upon my death, a certain amount of money goes in the trust for your brother, you can do that. Well, I mean, more so if he passes on. So what does about- Does he have assets? If, say that again. Does he have assets? No, that's the thing. There's, my, when my mother passed, she didn't have a will. She, like, nothing was in order. Um, I'm actually, I just received, like, his birth certificate. I got Medicaid. Like, I, I'm getting all that information slowly but surely. But my issue is, like, in the event, say, he passes tomorrow, is I, don't, he, I wouldn't know what to do. Like, what are the steps to protect him? I don't, I don't know if I'm... Is, is he currently receiving Social Security yes. SSI benefits, yes. right? Yes. And one of the things you can do is you can do a prepaid funeral, or you can plan for a prepaid funeral okay. and use the Social Security benefits, or at least a portion of them, to start paying for the prepaid funeral. Okay. So that this way, in the event something happens, that is one aspect that's completely taken care of. And okay. I assume that's what your greatest concern is, right? Yeah, that's, that's one of my greatest concerns, just because he is older than me. You know, they say the older ones tend to, you know, go first. But I just, because my mother didn't have anything in order, I just want to make sure I have things in order so for him. One of the things you have to look at is, did your, did your mother have any assets? I'm in the process of finding right. out that. So that, that, that can be that's going to be a big issue. Because if since she died without a will, correct? Yes. So on the intestacy statutes, he gets a piece of the estate. So whatever assets comes to him is, is going to be a problem with respect to eligibility for certain programs. So he would have to do um, a first party special trust. needs trust. So that those assets will not affect his social security benefits. Un unless you feel, you know, you don't have to do it. You can say, look, I don't mind him losing benefits right now. I'll use the money that he receives. And that's, that's okay, too. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I want to do that, but I guess I, maybe I can, I guess, set up an appointment with you. I don't know, because I just, again, I, I want to get everything in order. And I'm, but, like, right now, I'm, some of the things are really confusing do, do, to me because I don't, no. One of the things that we even said to the mayor when we began is that special needs, parents, siblings, friends, it is so difficult because it's overwhelming to just take care of the person, right, and make sure that the person is being taken care of, then to take on the second step, which is now I've got to make sure I've got all the paperwork and organizing in order. And you, you've obviously just suffered a loss, so there's an even greater factor. So hopefully you can find some help and, and, and sort of take it one step at a time. But definitely the DDD and making an application at, to the DDD. And we didn't really talk about the DDD tonight, which is the Division of Developmental Disabilities, which once a child turns 21, you should be making an application to the Division of Developmental Disabilities here in the state of New Jersey. That's going to make an evaluation, and that may help you with the guardianship and and your aspect when you asked before, they may be an agency that can offer you free services in obtaining the guardianship. So at least make that application to the Division of Developmental Disabilities. And what they will do is they will make an assessment as to uh, how much assets they will provide for that particular individual. And they have a range. Like some people are very, very, very disabled and they need a lot of services. Some people aren't as disabled and they might need a minimal amount of services. But that department certainly helps parents and, and 
siblings and family members. So you're in the right place in that regard. So I would say to you, make that application to the DDD. See if that can help you with your guardianship. But also, in your situation, I would say, seek out some counsel advice because you've got the estate that's also part of part of that issue and maybe they can help you organize now one thing is depending how much assets he does receive you may be able to use able accounts to put funds into the account over time so he wouldn't lose his assistance so an unable account you can put in 16 you can be one a child can only have one able account and you can put in sixteen thousand dollars a year into that account and it doesn't compromise ssi or medicaid so you may be able to, depending on how you structure it, depending on how much money is there, maybe use an ABLE account. And that's an opportunity uh, for you to do some estate planning and saying, okay, we're going to go to a bank, we're going to look for specifically an ABLE account. Uh, each state has their own ABLE account rules and regulations, but if you choose the state of New Jersey, obviously we live here, you're going to make that application for an ABLE account, and that'll give you up to what is it, about $100,000 for SSI, for S and SSI will not touch those money. So you can say, okay, I have a, I'm making application for SSI, I have less than $2,000 in the account, but we do have an ABLE account, and we're putting in, you know, whatever amounts we can at 16000 or less, but the maximum there is 100000 Thank you. I have a question online and we'll come back to the audience here. In the event of the death of a guardian, I'm assuming here, what protections can be put in place to protect my child from a guardian who does not care for the child effectively? I've heard some horror stories. Anything? I think well, you can always make an application to the court. Well, you, you need, you, this is sometimes why it's best to have two guardians two guardian. appointed, not just one single guardian. And you want to make sure other family members are watching what the guardian does and making sure the child is it neglected. If the child's neglected, they can bring an, an action to court, they can bring it to the attention of the surrogate is really what you would do, and, and it, it, they take it from there. Because remember, they got to file a report every year what they're doing for their child. If they're not filing the report, that becomes a problem. You know, there's supposed to be a monitoring program in place where they, they make sure these reports get filed every year and make sure that the guardian's doing what they're supposed to do. Now, as part of the guardian process, the guardian has to go through a background check and they do get fingerprinted. And the idea was because of these issues of inappropriate people being appointed as the guardian. Um, so yes, there can be bad, there can be bad guardians. Now, interestingly, the question is who has standing to bring those actions? Right. So technically, um, an attorney who is, who's represented the child, such as the court appointed attorney would have standing but the surrogate does. There's, they have standing to bring it. Anybody interested party can have standing to bring that action. Okay. All right. Any questions from the audience here? Yes. Let's have one because then I want to get an opportunity to other people. So let's stick to one, please. Thank you. <coughs> Do you accept guardianships that were taken out in another state? To oh, I can I, I applied yeah, for guardianship. So New Jersey does have a program where you can transfer in a guardianship into the state of New Jersey. Now, New Jersey, it's an application. You have to do the application in New Jersey for guardianship, but you have to pro provide from the school descendant state uh, an order saying that they agree to transfer the jurisdiction essentially to, to New Jersey. But not every state accepts that. So, example, I think in Florida, Florida doesn't allow for the transfer from one guardianship to another guardianship. They require you to go through the whole process in Florida, even though you had a guardianship up here done. So the transfer is a little easier. You're just making the application, say, I want to transfer the guardianship, say, from Delaware, and say, because I did that recently, to New Jersey. Come to New Jersey. Where I get these kind of papers? You can get them from the surrogate's office. From where? The surrogate's, surrogate's office. Surrogate's office. You're essentially going pro se. And the courts bend over backwards for pro se people. And I just want this gentleman to have an opportunity, because we only have a few minutes. Was that the same question? Okay, so this lady here, and then I'll come back to if we have time. And then recognize also, if you're leaving the state of New Jersey and you're going to go move to another state, you need to make sure that that state is going to accept the New Jersey guardianship. But that's if you want to do it. Yeah. Because I have some clients that live in a different state, the child is in the state, and they prefer to keep the jurisdiction here because New Jersey's laws are a little 
preferential on certain things that they've done. Um, my brother is 54, and my parents decided to never get guardianship of him. He has Down syndrome. He currently lives with my mom. She has bequeathed nothing to him in her will because she knows that the state will take it all away. Um, can I still get guardianship of him? Yes, sure. Absolutely. The, the priority is, <clears throat> the statute is, it's the parents first. Then actually, it, if, the, if the child was married, it'd be a spouse, and then it would be their children. But it presumably is not married, has no children. Priority is the parent. After the parent, it's the sibling. So yes, you have. So I would go through the same process. Right, that my but, would have. but your mom would would either have to renounce the appointment, or she goes. To, you go together as joint guardians. That's going to be a tough one. <laughs> well, I'll say this too: the lot. Of, the, there's been a trend for a long time now that a lot of clients have children that are in a, been in a group home and the parents are getting older and the group home or the facility is saying, look, you need to have someone in place, a su successor, because something happens to you, we don't want to have a gap in, in, in someone in coverage and no one being able we can talk to. So many times you bring an application to bring in the other other children as co-guardians at that time. Well, he lives at home with her and she just believes that I'm going to take care of him, which of course I will, but I need you to need, have things You in need place. to be a point. Conversation has to be had. Yeah. yeah. And he re actually receives Medicare because he worked in competitive employment and paid into it long enough. So, um, and so that also has an effect. If you've never worked, then it's SSI. If it's you have worked, then it's SSID uh, with, with the disability piece. And then Obviously, we've also talked about just straight Social Security for those people who are over the age of 65, so it depends. And if you have a disabled parent, you sometimes will get benefits because you have a disabled parent. So it just depends on where they fit into the system I and what the circumstances are. Now, I want to add one thing that I should have mentioned. is Part of the process when you design these plans, you have to make sure you have the assets correctly entitled or beneficiary designation. Primarily, most people, their assets consist of the house and their retirement account. That's the vast majority of people. In retirement accounts, you don't want to name the child as the beneficiary of it. So, because if you do, that it blows their governmental assistance. But you can name the special needs trust as the beneficiary of the trust. And because the child is disabled, they can take that money out, if it's done correctly, over the child's life expectancy, as opposed to in a, a child that's not disabled and is not a minor, that money has to come out over a 10-year period of time by law. So when you set these asset, these trusts up, you have to look at how all the assets are set up. Who are the beneficiaries? You want to make sure, you want to make sure the child is never the direct beneficiary of anything. And for example, insurance we talked about briefly is, you know, a lot of clients will buy second to die insurance policies to provide money for the child, you know, the child's for, in the trust for the child in case something happens to both children to make sure there's enough money there. And it's, it's a very common, commonly done, but most time when you do this, the second die insurance is placed into an insurance trust. It's an irrevocable trust that you can't change it. And the reason to do that is for tax purposes so that it's not part of their, the parents' estate for estate tax purposes. Now we don't have an estate tax at the time being. And federal, depending on where you're at, doesn't matter. Now, by the way, one other thing is, just because you have a disabled child doesn't mean you have to have a special needs trust because you have it in a substantial amount of money, it's irrelevant. So if you had like $10 million, you don't need a special needs trust. But also take into consideration when we're talking about, don't forget your retirement account or your um, insurance policy. Make sure that the, if you have the special needs trust, that that is what is the designated benefit, beneficiary on the policy. Because if you put the disabled person on the policy, that money is going to go directly to them, and then we've defeated the purpose of the, uh, you know, you're, you're back at facing that they have more than $2,000 worth of assets. So don't forget about your retirement accounts and, and things of that nature that you've declared a beneficiary on. You want to make sure that the beneficiary is either not the special needs person or it's the special needs trust that's designated. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, James. This brings us to the end of this, uh, this period that we have a Q&A. Uh, 
an hour and 15, I didn't think we'd go this long. So uh, that's how much information. We could have gotten longer, Mary. We, we could have. Uh, that's how much information there is. Um, I want to thank the PAL for putting this program together and bringing this out for our special needs family. I think there was a lot of information that I think our audience, both here in person and on Facebook, out on social media has. And again, this will be replayed so that people can access this as they desire and replay it. Um, so again, we thank you. We thank you all that are here tonight. We have a great amount of people here and all of the people watching at home. Thanks so much. Jim, thank you so much. Thank you, Mayor. Sandra, thank you so thank much. Thank you, Mayor. Appreciate all the information. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening.